Okay, okay, okay. All right. Okay. Are you, is it? Okay, so we can restart. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah? okay, excellent. <laughs> if you're not ready, tough luck, you're going to happen anyway. <laughs> so uh, let us uh, carry on, as they say. Uh, um, so we have had a look at the idea of uh, uh, rebirth. Uh, and um, I'm going to say a little bit more about rebirth before we carry on with the next part, which is uh, all day, growing old. It sounds, sounds depressing anyway, so let's stick with rebirth for now. <laughs> all day, it's too depressing. Let's stay with rebirth for a while. Huh? <laughs> growing older. Growing older, right, okay. So, you, yeah. What was that? Old age. You want to hear about old age or rebirth? Postpone it. How to postpone it? Uh, okay, I'll teach you all about that. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming up. Yeah. Uh, how to how to kind of deal with the whole issue in one go. Uh. So I want to talk a bit more about uh, the idea of rebirth because it's such an important idea uh, on the Buddhist path. Uh. And if you get a more of a feel for the idea of rebirth, actually, it's incredibly useful in your practice. Uh. So I want to say a little bit more about this, and you can see the way that it is presented here, is presented as a reality, it's presented as an insight of the Buddha. Yeah? This is basically the truth of how the wor world works uh, from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, and uh, I don't know if any of you have any problem with the idea of rebirth. If you do, I would, uh, what I would recommend you to do is just to uh, not to dismiss it out of hand, uh, but merely to say, okay, I don't know about this, and then see what happens as you investigate the suit, uh, as you investigate maybe the evidence that is available in the world uh, for these kind of things. Uh, and as you do that, you start to get more of a kind of feeling for this whole idea of rebirth. Uh, I think this is a very important point, not to dismiss these things, because if you dismiss the idea of rebirth, uh, what you are doing essentially, you are dismissing the awakening of the Buddha. Yeah? That's pretty important, right? So if you're dismissing the awakening of the Buddha, are you a Buddhist? Uh, <laughs> Very dicey, right? I mean, it's, I, the, the whole point of being a Buddhist, what it means to be a Buddhist, uh, is that you take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Taking refuge in the Buddha means that you recognize or you think that the Buddha had some insight into the nature of reality. That's what refuge is all about. Yeah, the Buddha, okay, he knew. Let me, let me take it seriously what he said here. Huh? So, by dismissing that, you are kind of maybe a fence-sitting Buddhist at the very best, right? You're kind of a little bit <laughs> on thin ice there, but you are... Uh, but of course, I'm, what I'm not saying is that we should just take these things on blindly. If you feel doubt about it, uh, you have to be honest about that, uh, but at the very least, investigate it. Uh, a lot of people in the modern world are dubious about these kind of teachings. Uh, I am not dubious at all, but I, that's, that's up to people. Uh, but uh, sh certainly look into it. Uh. So the Buddha is presenting it here as if it is a reality. Yeah? The problem is that we are attached to things that get reborn, uh, and when you are infatuated, you are in love with, you are tied to, you are attached to these things, that is what it means to seek things that are reborn. You are seeking it because your mind is kind of moving towards it, uh, holding on to these things. Uh. So. Um, how can we get closer to this idea? So one way of getting closer to it, of course, is to read the suttas, uh, read some of the things the Buddha was talking about. Uh, and uh, you have probably done that already to some extent. And sometimes the problem with the suttas is that it is a little bit kind of dry. Yeah? It's a little bit sort of theoretical. Uh, it doesn't really touch you in a deep way. Uh, that's the way I have felt sometimes about the suttas. It's like sometimes it touches you in a deep way, but sometimes it seems a bit sort of... Um, it seems a little bit, um, it's, it's like a, um, a synopsis of what haps, happens in real life, uh, kind of drawn together into very few lines. That makes it very, not really, you don't really feel the truth of it in the same way as a story, for example, or someone telling you a story about rebirth. Uh, so uh, uh, for this reason, I think it's often useful to do more than just reading the suttas. Uh, reading suttas is only a starting point. Uh, and one of the things that I have found quite useful sometimes uh, is to read some of the stories that are available in the world, uh, things like near-death experiences. Uh, yeah, you've heard about near-death experiences? Yeah, very, some, of this, some of these things are actually very interesting. Uh, and I, have, I read a book not so long ago, which was called After. Uh, and af 
after AFTER. It's a very short title for the book. Yeah. And, uh, and this book is writ was written by an American scientist, who is, his name is Bruce Grayson. Uh, and he is the leading authority in the world on near-death experience. He's at the University of Virginia. University of Virginia is one of the few top-notch universities in the world that actually do real research into these kind of things, yeah? into near-death experiences, children who remember past lives, all of these kind of things that are very interesting. Yeah? And so he wrote a book. And in this book, he tells all these stories uh, about people who had near-death experiences. Uh, yeah, and that's very, very fascinating. These are like real people telling real stories. Uh, and it's very hard to dismiss it. Yeah, if you hear someone tell your story, this is what happened to me, you can't really dismiss it afterwards. Uh, and I would actually be interested to hear if any of you here have had near-death experiences. I, if you want to, you don't have to kind of raise your hand or anything, but if any of you have had these kind of experiences and you'd like to share it, uh, it'd be wonderful to hear, uh, because you don't have to be afraid of being called a nutcase in this... <laughs> in this assembly, yeah, because these are people who share kind of your ideas. So we're very fascinating. And if you don't want to, uh, you know, to kind of uh, reveal your identity, if you want to just write something down on a piece of paper or something, you can as well, because I'd be fascinated to see. Usually in a crowd like this, uh, there's going to be a few people who have these kind of experiences. Uh. And so these experiences in this book, yeah, that talk about people who have some kind of terrible accident or some kind of a really difficult thing, yeah, and then they have this sensation of suddenly being the bystander, yeah, being the observer, who observing kind of, the observing maybe their own body, yeah, their own body may be very badly injured, yeah, and then they see all the medical people coming around, right, sorting out their own body, yeah, but they're kind of looking on as if they are not really in a disinterested way, yeah, wow, what's this happening? Is that me down there? What's this body there? It looks a bit like me. <laughs> and this is kind of the feeling they have, right? But they feel at peace and they feel at ease while this thing is going on. Everyone is rushing around trying to save their life. Uh, and then, uh, of course, sometimes they have all kinds of experience. Maybe they have experiences of meeting their relatives who have already deceased beforehand, right? Uh, and this is a very common thing that we also see, uh, sometimes see in the suttas, the idea that you get reborn again uh, with your relatives in a past life because of the attachments or whatever. So we get drawn together to these people. Just like we are drawn together in this life uh, with people that we are close to, that we are attached to, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, so then they kind of maybe see their relatives and they have this vision uh, of an alternative reality. Yeah? That, is very, that kind of opens their eyes to something much, much grander than they ever had before. Uh. And this is what I was saying before about this idea of rebirth. Uh, suddenly you have this panoramic insight, uh, panoramic understanding of existence that spans over multiple lifetimes, uh, spans over this vast kind of scene of reality which is far greater than what you ever thought was actually possible. And this is what these people have a direct understanding of, this larger tapestry of the world, uh, the greater um, kind of... Uh, painting of our existence across, few, across many, many lifetimes. Uh, and so then, uh, after that experience, uh, somehow they get revived, all those medics on the ground which are looking after their body, they have success or whatever, uh, and then they come back to life again. Uh, and when they come back to life again, their life is transformed. Uh, yeah, it is changed. It's as if they become more spiritual. Uh, suddenly, instead of living for all the material things of the world, for the status, for all the uh, you know, increasing your bank account for becoming more famous and well-liked by all the people around you. Huh? Suddenly you become much more compassionate in the world. Huh? You become more kind, you become more generous, you become more caring, huh? you become more understanding. You want to look after people in a new way. Huh? It transforms your reality, it transforms your understanding. What is the purpose of life? What life is it really about? Huh? So it's kind of powerful, just that vision of a larger reality changed as your attitude fundamentally. Why? Because you understand in the larger scene of things what is important in this life actually isn't that important. Uh, what matters is this larger picture of things. Uh, and in that larger picture of things, well, it is those qualities that go across the lifetimes, uh, the qualities that you take with you from one life to the next one, uh, the goodness of your heart, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the, the beautiful qualities within, uh, that is what actually matters. Uh, and you, because you see it directly, it is intuitive. Uh, 
It's no longer intellectual whether there's rebirth or not. It's intuitive that you become a better person. Eh? So please read some of these stories. Eh? Because when you read those stories, eh, you don't actually have to have a near-death experience uh, because we, I'm not sure if we can help you with that. Is there any way of helping people have a near-death experience? Is there? <laughs> we, can, we can take you up here, we can pretend that we're going to do something. No, we, no, we can't do that. Uh, <coughs> so you can't, we can't really make this happen to you. But what we can do, uh, and this is kind of fascinating, you can read about other people having these experiences. Uh, and they say that just by reading other people having the experiences, that is enough. Uh, to help you having a similar kind of effect on your life. Uh, I remember when I was reading it, it was very strong. It was like, wow, yeah, this is, adds something more. It adds details, details that you don't actually find in the suttas. Uh, but it kind of fills in the gaps of what you have in the suttas to make this real in a very different way. Uh. So try to read these stories. Uh. Maybe you should buy this book, Bobby, for the library in, this, uh, in BGF. Is that a good idea? Yeah, make, make a note after. Is the name of the book. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to boss you around, Bobby, but I'm just being it. After is the name of the book, yeah, written by a fellow called Bruce, Bruce Grayson is his name. Uh, he's an American. It's, if you, I think if you search, on, there's only one book in the world called After, so you should be easy to, <laughs> easy to find. Uh, yeah. And it would be nice to, nice to have in your library if you haven't got it already. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm getting more bossy as I get older as a monk. So I'm kind of telling, <laughs> telling people what to do. So, uh, so please have a look at that and see what that does to you. And I can almost guarantee that it will have some kind of effect on your life. And this is one of the main purposes of having an idea of rebirth. Right? The idea, of course, yes, I was talking about before about this kind of large uh, you know, idea of rebirth being scary and rebirth being problematic. Uh, and that is true, that is also important. Uh, but even more powerful and even more immediate is the idea that the idea of rebirth makes you a better person. Uh, yeah? And if it makes you a better person, it means that it's easier for you to fulfill the morality on the Buddhist path. Uh, you become more kind to your fellow Buddhists, to your family, to your work colleagues, to everyone. You meet someone down the road, some random person, you say good morning to them. You say, what, what happened? I say good morning to a random person. Is that, do anyone do that here in, in uh, Malaysia, saying good morning to random people? Uh, don't do that, right? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't really happen. But once you understand the kind of the larger picture of things, you become more daring. Uh, you're not so, very often we limit ourselves because of fear, because of being afraid of the, of the world outside. Uh, and we don't really dare to say hello to random people. Uh. But sometimes it's a beautiful thing to do. Uh. Yeah, and you can just, you, someone might just feel a bit, oh, what's happening? Say random, saying good morning to me. <laughs> but actually, it adds some light in the world, something beautiful in the world, when we do random acts of kindness. Uh. And I have started, I was, I remember I came, I just came here to the, um, uh, when I, in KL, actually, I was arriving yesterday here in KL. I've just come. I've just arrived here, you know, just yesterday. Uh, and I came to the airport, uh, and good morning, and, or good afternoon, or whatever it is. Uh, <coughs> and when I arrived here in KL, there was this enormous line in the immigration, right? I said, oh, no, immigration line. And I could see that everyone in the line was thinking just like me, oh, no. Everyone was really sour, looking down, playing with a mobile phone, no one talking to anyone. Uh, everyone looking really miserable. That's the kind of the immigration lines around the world, yeah? Miserable places, uh, no one talking. Uh, and then I thought, well, why at least maybe I can be a little bit of a light to people. And my idea, the way I t try to live my life, is always to ask myself, what can I do now that is kind? What can I do now that is compassionate? This is how I, I don't always succeed. But this is kind of my idea. So I never waste an opportunity. Uh, and so I took the opportunity to say hello to the people next to me in line, right? Uh, and actually, usually, they're very happy with that. Uh, yeah? And the people next to me, they were people of Indian background. They were actually turned out to have Australian passports. Uh, and I came from, <laughs> so it was kind of strange. They came from Fiji, Fiji originally. Uh, and, uh, but then we had a little bit of a conversation, right? Uh, and it's kind of very simple conversation, but just to kind of brighten people's day a little bit. Uh, because, uh, you know, as a monk, I, I don't tend to say too many negative things. I try to avoid saying too many negative things anyway. And so you do that. Uh, and then I, 
uh, there were some women in front of me, but they were so difficult to get contact. I gave up on those women, so I just okay, let let them go. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I think sometimes women, if they start talking, them they get a bit scared, a bit concerned. What is it? What does he want? Right. So I okay, better better let them leave them alone. Otherwise. <laughs> So uh, that so these are little things, right? That sometimes in life we kind of just say hello to random people. I was in the United States recently. I just came back from the United States a couple of weeks ago, and in the U.S., people are quite open. Yeah, people say, "Ah, good morning, how are you?" So I started saying, "Good morning, how are you?" to everyone, <laughs> and it's kind of it's kind of cool when that, when that sort of thing happens. So it changes your attitude. Yeah, once you read those stories, uh, you kind of touches your heart in a very deep way. Yeah? You become a different person. Yeah? So please do this. Yeah? There was another example of this. This is an example I, I always like to hear about people who have near-death experiences. Uh, and we had a lady staying in our monastery in Perth, a really nice lady. Uh, she's Australian, she has a Latvian background, so some kind of small country in Europe. Uh, that's where she came from originally. Uh, and she's a very, very spiritual person. Uh, she's more spiritual than most of the monks and nuns I know about. Uh, she's kind of this extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary person. She lives on this small, actually not small, the large property on her own. Uh, imagine, yeah, she's a woman. She has this large 150-acre property, and she has a little hut, and that's where she lives. Yeah? And she, apparently she has a shotgun under her bed, so he, just, just in case some dodgy people kind of come, <laughs> come into it. <laughs> But she is this amazing person. She just meditates all the time, yeah. And she is very kind of caring and very compassionate, and has a lot of deep meditation experience and all of these kind of things. So when she came to the monastery, I asked her if she wanted to have like a Q and A with the monks, or maybe even giving a bit of a talk to the monks. Yeah, this is quite rare to ask a laywoman to give a talk to the monks, but she was one of those rare exceptions. I thought it might be interesting. Yeah, and so she told a little bit about her life history. Yeah. I should say, by the way, Bodhinyana Monastery is one of the few places where actually we don't try. We try not to be so hi hierarchical. Huh? So recently we had Ajahn Hasapanya from Damasara Monastery. Huh? You know Ajahn Hasapanya? Yeah, yeah. N yeah. Some of you don't. She is the uh, abbot of Damasara Monastery in Perth, the nuns' monastery in Perth. Huh? Yeah, and she is from Malaysia originally. Huh? She's from Ipoh. Yeah, she's from Ipoh, <laughs> and she is very, very, very nice nun. Huh? She, uh, I respect her a lot. Huh? She is a good meditator. Uh, she is very, always very happy, very upbeat person, uh, and a very super nice nun. And uh, so I, sometimes I like to invite her to the monastery to give a talk to the monks. Yeah. So we did that recently, only a couple of months ago. We had her to Bodhinyana Monastery to give a talk to the monks, uh, and I do that occasionally because it's nice sometimes to hear from someone else. And also it's nice to hear from the opposite gender, because opposite gender sometimes we have slightly different life experiences, uh, and that makes it fascinating to hear. And uh, so this is kind of, anyway, how I like to do things sometimes, just to expand the horizons a little bit, not to be too conservative, not to do things exactly the same way as everyone else, right? Uh, so um, anyway, so back to this lady who was uh, give, uh, talking to the monks. Uh, and uh, so she started talking about her life experiences. Uh, and one of the things that she said that she too had one of these near-death experiences. Uh, and she said that uh, one day she was having this very powerful epileptic attack. Uh, and if the epilepsy is very profound and very deep, uh, then sometimes your body freezes. You get a seizure. The whole body kind of stops working properly. So she was jolted out of her bed. Uh, she was lying on the ground. And the whole body froze. Uh, and because the whole body froze, uh, she couldn't do anything. She couldn't even breathe, right? Because the, to breathe, you have to move. So if everything freezes, you can't even breathe. Uh. And at that moment, when she couldn't even breathe, uh, she thought, uh, this is it. Uh, I'm going to die here. If you can't breathe, you can't live, right? That's kind of obvious. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to die here. And the moment she thought that she was going to die, uh, at that moment, she felt a regret. Uh, she felt that even though this is the most wonderful person in the world, uh, the most moral person you can almost think of, everyone has done a few things that we regret, right? Uh, is there anyone here who has not done anything that you regret? <laughs> no? Lot, lot, yeah, a lot of regrets. Okay, 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 okay. I thought you were going to say I have a lot of non-regrets with it. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been nice. Yeah. 
So we all have some regrets, yeah? I regret to say that I also have some regrets. So, <laughs> so we even regret our regrets, that's the problem. Yeah. So, and she thought that moment, uh, she realized, if I have a regret in my heart, uh, I can't die. It means I'm not ready to die. I have to sort this out first of all. Yeah, This is how painful it is to die with a regret. You feel you can't really die. You're not ready for it. And so what she did at that moment, she started with the best of her ability to try to breathe again. And gradually, gradually, over the next half an hour, she was able to start breathing again. First just a little bit in and out. And eventually she was breathing properly again. It took about half an hour. And then she knew she was going to live. And then, of course, she was able to deal with those things where she had regret. She was able to go back, maybe ask for, apologize and ask for forgiveness and all of these kind of things. And then to kind of resolve those issues. And then she said that the impact of that near-death experience that she had was that the idea of being moral, the idea of living well was so powerfully imprinted in her mind, yeah, always at the back of her mind. She could never forget it again. Huh? And after that, her entire life was about living morally. Huh? Her entire life was about doing the right thing in all kinds of situations. So this is the power of the idea of rebirth. It gives you this broader context. You understand reality in a far better way. It makes you a better person. It makes you strive in a completely different way. It makes you understand the limitations of our ordinary worldly happinesses and pleasures. And it moves you towards the spiritual path instead. So these things are really, really worthwhile. These things are really powerful. And actually, uh, they start to transform your, your entire life when you look at these things in the right way. Huh? So please don't underestimate these things. Huh? And this is why the Buddha, probably one of the reasons why he brings it up here, yeah? because he already had this broader idea of things. Huh? Yeah? Give up the attachment, the holding on. Huh? And as you do this, huh? as you reflect in this way, what you will find is that you start to loosen your attachments a little bit to the world. Huh? Yeah, That is not a bad thing. Maybe you think that's a bad thing. No, it's a very good thing to do that. Maybe you think that you, I won't care for my kids anymore. No, you will care more for your kids if you do that. You will care for them in a spiritual way. That spiritual way of caring is far better than the normal way of caring that we have. The normal way we have of caring is too much tied up with our own sense of self, with what we want from our kids, instead of what is best for our kids. So it's a far better way all, all around uh, to have this kind of attitude. Uh, understanding the nature of rebirth, uh, having the bigger picture of reality is far, far superior to you. So this is the right way of thinking about this. Uh. So this is uh, the idea of rebirth, why it is, uh, I think, the why the Buddha brings it up at this particular point uh, and why it matters to contemplate these things in the right way. Uh. And uh, I have noticed that uh, many of those, especially monastics, who have doubts about rebirth or don't believe in rebirth, uh, they never really remain in the robes. They tend to disrobe. Uh, and the reason why they disrobe is that because the whole idea of the spiritual path, uh, and especially being a monastic, uh, you need some kind of large view of reality to make the monastic path sustainable. You know, if you're just going to live one life, okay, why give up, you know, all the other happinesses in life, but, you know, and maybe if you are a very good meditator, you become a monastic, but it, in, the investment that you make into monastic life makes far more sense uh, when you have the idea of rebirth. Uh, very often, people who don't believe in it, they end up disrobing here. Yeah. So this is a very powerful and useful contemplation here. Yeah. So uh, let me stop there, because uh, this is kind of, uh, I'm going to go move on to the other contemplations now in a second. Uh, but let's just try, I'll try to follow the schedule a little bit more. Let's do five minutes of meditation together, and then we'll come back to some more questions and answers.
Okay, everyone. Um, so, uh, now is an opportunity to ask some questions or make some comments if you like. Uh, so please uh, fire away, as they say. Yeah. Yeah, Chan. Please, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the sutta, there is uh, when the monk meet and they they talking about dharma, right? Yeah. Do you have uh, like uh, uh, idea of what they talk and how they talk and about the dharma? Uh, okay, that's interesting <laughs> because uh, well, that will, that will obviously vary depending on the occasion. Do you mean on this specific occasion or just generally? Uh, generally. Generally, okay. Well, I can tell you what it was on this specific occasion because it actually says uh, <laughs> what it is, uh, and uh, what they were talking about was the qualities of the Buddha. Yeah, so they're talking about the qualities of the Buddha. That is also talking about the Dhamma, because uh, uh, the, the Buddha kind of embodies uh, the Dhamma. Uh, the Buddha is like the Dhamma in, in the living form, in the living being. Yeah, because everything the Buddha is, because he is perfected, because he has full insight into these teachings, his whole behavior, everything he says, or ev everything he behaves, uh, will be a reflection of the Dhamma that he has discovered. Uh, so that is what is happening in this particular case. Uh, so uh, you can see it's quite broad, right? Uh, so it, would, it could be anything, I think, uh, that is kind of within the scope of the suttas, basically. Uh, uh, anything that, uh, you know, understanding the nature of the suttas and understanding what it means. Maybe the Buddha has said something and they, maybe they have doubt about what it means. They might discuss that. Uh, there's an interesting place in the Anguttara Nikaya where there is a, one of these verses, and this verse is quite cryptic. Uh, it's hard to read, you know, verse is supposed to be inspirational and not always clear, right? It's a little bit cryptic. And then all these monks come together and they say, yeah, this is how I understand this. Uh, and the second monk says, no, no, this is how I understand it. It's different. And the third monk says, no, no, this is how. And the six different monks, each one with different understanding of this verse. Uh, and this verse is something about the seamstress sewing things together. You know that verse? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then they uh, go to the Buddha and they ask the Buddha, well, which one of us spoke the truth? Uh, and the Buddha says, you all spoke the truth, yeah? But here is my interpretation, it was a different one again. Huh? And, and, so, and, and so that's fascinating, right? It shows that sometimes that the Dhamma doesn't, there is not one right answer very often. There can be different angles on things, different understandings. So, so when you have a discussion, you can often bring out more full understanding of the Dhamma because someone else has a different point of view. So we shouldn't be too quick to disagree with other people, yeah? Very often we think, I have my own opinion, it disagrees with yours, because maybe you're both right, uh, or maybe you're both partially right. Usually both are partially right, and no one is fully right, except if you are a stream entry, right? Uh, so we should listen to each other and learn from each other in that way, and then maybe we can expand, we can have more harmony when we listen in a good way to each other. Uh, and I think this is part of what is uh, going on here, these kind of discussions uh, 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 broadening out. Uh, and I also think that this is maybe how the commentarial literature of Buddhism got started. Uh, yeah? Monks coming together, discussing, and saying, oh, wait a minute, but no one understands it. We better write it down, right? <laughs> so you write it down, uh, or you pass it on orally, your understanding, and that becomes then the beginning of the commentaries, right? Uh, because this is a comment on the word of the Buddha. Maybe they even go to the Buddha and ask, have we got it right? And then he gives his stamp of approval, ding, authentic. <laughs> <laughs> authenticity proven. And then it becomes an, a part of the commentary as, as a consequence. Uh, so uh, that's how I kind of maybe regard this, this, this Dhamma discussion. So, yeah. so anything from pra practical things to theoretical things about dependent origination to how to watch the breath to, you know, uh, how to, uh, whatever, uh, you know, the, the Vinaya rules, etc., uh, etc. Et all right. Anyone else like to say? Oh, many hands going up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just speak. Just. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Venerable Sir. Good afternoon. Um, this morning, I, I just wish to confirm that I hear it correctly. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, these three items, 
old age, sickness and death. Yeah. Uh, were things that uh, Buddha, Buddha uh, makes Buddha go forth. Yeah, yeah. But the idea about rebirth may not be, but however it is included in this sutta. Yeah. Uh, my question is, so, r r so the whole thing about the whole teaching about rebirth. Yeah. I, is it the words of the Buddha? Um, okay, so let me uh, let me um, clarify a bit. What I what I meant to say, and I probably was a bit confusing this morning. I, I apologize for that, but that's kind of what it's like to be a teacher. Sometimes things come out nicely, other times things come out in a heap of uh, kind of uh, jumbled words that don't really make much sense. So that's unfortunately the reality of life. But um, my point was that the main things the Buddha contemplated to uh, go forth was sickness, uh, uh, old age and that these are the three main things because these are things we find throughout the suttas uh, the idea of rebirth you only find in this particular sutta so it's kind of more it is not a fundamental part of the things the buddha contemplated right uh, but because it is in this sutta i would say it may have formed a little bit part of what the buddha thought about yeah i i said i, I did say you're quite right that maybe it is a later addition but actually i I, I don't really have much foundation for saying that. I would argue that it is more likely to be something the Buddha did reflect on, or the Buddha to be reflected on, but it was not the core part of the things he reflected on. Uh, and that's why it's only mentioned in one place. Uh, uh, but, uh, and the, very importantly, the idea of rebirth is incredibly important. Yeah? It is not some kind of uh, side issue that is, doesn't matter. Uh, even if the Buddha didn't think about it before his awakening, it would have been because he didn't know about it. And because he didn't know about it, it was hard for him to ref reflect on it. But once he had his awakening and he knew the truth of rebirth, well, then he had every reason to teach it, right? Because then he knew about it. So I, the last thing I want to do is to minimize the importance of rebirth. It's incredibly, incredibly important. And I would say that if you have doubts about it, that's okay, but please don't dismiss it out of hand. Uh, you are going to, it's going to be really bad for your own progress in the Dhamma if you do that. And sooner or later you're going to dismiss the Dhamma and you're going to convert to an atheist or an agnostic or a Muslim or a Christian or whatever, but you're definitely not going to be a Buddhist after that and you're going to kind of... <laughs> so uh, it, it's really, really important. So Benny, thank you for asking that question. I'm really happy about that because it's nice to get able to clarify things. Uh, yeah. All right. Yes, uh, Achan. Just what you explained, or what you what you mentioned about uh, rebirth, I wouldn't agree that it's only in this sutta or in in one or a few sutta. I think the Buddha talk about rebirth on so many occasions. Let's just say when he say, countless we have been reborn in samsara endlessly. We we yeah. we wandering around. Yeah. Uh, but after birth, or, or so many tears you have shed uh, 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 during in samsara, when he, for yeah. example, when he talks about samsara, the endless cycle, so the yeah. rebirth must be included Ab in absolutely, that for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It comes another sutta yeah. to my uh, yeah. to the mind where it about the the king and the four messengers that came from the north, from the east, from all four directions, mm. and uh, the messengers came to the. Yeah. Uh, to the king and said, oh, king from the south is uh, coming a, a mighty uh, uh, mountain towards you and crushing all under mm -hmm. you. And the, the first was, uh, was uh, old age, sickness, uh, death. And then the fourth one was rebirth, if I'm not, if, uh, if you know this. I don't think, uh, well, I th anyway, I know, I know the suit I talk about. I know, yeah, 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 any, yeah. Anyway. Well, I, the, the point I was trying to make, remember that, um, I, I'm not saying that it's only here that he speaks about rebirth. The point I'm making is that I'm saying it's only here that rebirth is mentioned as a motivation for the Buddha to go forth. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah? This is only about the motivation to go forth and become a monastic in practice. Uh, it is not about the general idea of rebirth because that happens after his awakening. That's when that general idea becomes very important. Uh, this is specifically about motivation. So this is about kind of the right view, if you like. Yeah, the right view, the Buddha sees the world in a certain way, uh, and that right view, that enables him then to practice properly and motivate him for that practice. So, yeah. Please, yes. Uh, regarding the consciousness uh, passing on to the next mm. people,
Yeah, yeah. regarding the yeah. carrying on our personality traits to on to the next life. Uh, I heard like from medical history that they have people who are dementia or who have severe symptoms. Yeah. But before they die, they somehow, somehow have clarity yeah. and they have dropped all the symptoms. Yeah. Uh, but that's from the medical point of uh, historical or some some record. Yeah. But in the Sutta, uh, what does Buddha say about our uh, process of changing into the next rebirth, carrying on our yeah. personality trait like being violent or depressive or mm. all kinds. You know, can, can you elaborate sure, on that? Sure, yeah. So, the, uh, I mean, I think the important point here is that uh, the idea of rebirth is very similar to what happens in this life. Yeah. So, if you look at yourself over a period of 10, 20, 30 years, and you look at what you are like over that period, you will see that there are certain personality traits that continue across long expanses of time and that there are certain traits that change. Yeah? So there's continuity and there is change. And because it is your mind that carries on into a new life, because that is the case, it is exactly the same principle that work across lifetimes that work within a lifetime. Yeah, so across lifetime, you will see exactly the same thing as you see within one lifetime. Within one lifetime, as I mentioned, you see change, you see continuity. Across lifetime, exactly the same thing. Yeah. So uh, you will basically carry on those personality traits that you have, uh, uh, that especially those traits that you die with, yeah, that you have at the very end of your life, uh, that will then carry on into the future because it is just your mind carrying on, just as it is in this particular life. Uh, so the example of dementia, that is, uh, is a very interesting example. It is apparently it's called terminal lucidity. Uh, there's a medical term for that because it's quite commonly seen in hospitals around the world. People dying, they are really demented, they have Alzheimer's, they can't remember anyone. And the last 10 minutes of their life, think, oh, wow, my son, my daughter, how are you? I haven't seen you for many, a long, long time. Yeah? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, and, uh, that, and of course, from a medical point of view, it's very hard to explain because if you're your brain is completely deteriorated, how can you be lucid towards the very end? But from a Buddhist point of view, it makes a lot of sense, uh, because your mind is trapped in this very sick brain, uh, yeah? because the body and, and mind obviously are very closely related to each other, and then as you come very close to your death, your mind starts to release from the body. Uh, and because it is released from the body, is it no longer trapped by that brain which is so sick? Yeah? And that's what enables you to see things uh, uh, that you haven't seen for a very long time. Uh, yeah, your dementia, your Alzheimer's, no longer blocks the mind from being what it actually is. Uh, so behind the surface of the sickness, uh, the mind is still the same. Uh, yeah, the mind is always there behind the surface. Uh, and as soon as the body is gone, it goes back to its uh, o original state that it was before it had the al Alzheimer's illness. Uh, so there is continuity there. Uh. But isn't that rather despairing and pessimistic if we continue to carry on our personality trait to the next many lifespan? Unless it, we cultivate really very, very... Yeah, it, it is only <laughs> despairing and pessimistic if you are a bad person. Yeah, but if you are a good person, and I know you are a good person. <laughs> so. But we are not going to be a stream enterer. We are, it's just <laughs> going to be a, such a painful samsara. It is, it is not about whether it's pessimistic. Or it's, it's about whether it's realistic. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, that is really the interesting question. Because pessimism and optimism, well, that's kind of very subjective. The question is, is it realistic? And if it is realistic, you know what you have to do. Huh? <laughs> very long samsara. <laughs> no, it depends. It's up to you, right? This is, this is one of... The point, remember, the point of this uh, is a right view. Yeah, this is the point. So once you understand this, uh, it actually encourages, encourages you to practice in the right way. That is what this is about. We are now looking at right view. This is the beginning of the path. The Buddha-to-be is reflecting on the nature of the world. He sees there is rebirth. That is what motivates him to become the Buddha. That is what motivates you too to become, to become what? The Buddha, Sri Mentor, Arahanta, yeah? It's really up to you, whatever you want to become. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's stop there because we're gonna, it's going to be too many. If you have more questions, please write them down and we will come back to those at the end. Of, we have a long Q&A session at the end of the day and we can do those uh, at the very end of the day. So please uh, do that instead. Huh? And now we want to carry on a little bit.
Okay, so let me just, um, just very briefly then just uh, uh, remind you that uh, the idea here with uh, looking at these things, we are looking at the Buddha at the very beginning before he has left the household life. So we are looking at the things that motivate the Buddha to become a monk, yeah, or the Buddha to be, to become a monk, to practice the path, to overcome suffering. That's what we're looking at. So what these things are, they are essentially about right view, yeah, the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path, seeing the world in the right way. So when we're looking here at the idea of rebirth, it's looking at right view and how to develop the idea of, of that kind of right view. Yeah. Yeah, and if you do develop this idea of right view, which is rebirth, it has very powerful consequences. Uh, yeah, it actually starts to uh, make you live your life according to the Noble Eightfold Path, essentially. Uh, so, let us carry on with this idea of right view. What other aspects are there to this right view? And we have seen it already. And what should be described as liable to grow old? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chicken and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to grow old. Yeah, kind of obvious. These are all the, uh, the wealth that you have, all these uh, beings uh, uh, in your life, and also your family members, etc. Everyone is liable to grow old. If you are too attached to these things, uh, you have a problem. Uh, it's kind of sweet that they are attached to their slaves, isn't it? Uh, Male and female bond servants. Uh, oh, my s dear slaves, I don't want to let go of you. Huh? This kind of nice kind of slavery, isn't it? Uh, oh, my slave, let me give you a hug. It's like you're looking after your slaves. Uh, it's not kind of the harsh kind of slavery, but the friendly kind of sl friendly slavery. <laughs> I'm not sure about this. <laughs> okay. Employees, I think. Call employees, right? <laughs> okay. Is that what you call employees here in Malaysia? Slaves? <laughs> <laughs> volunteers, <laughs> that's what it's like. slaves, volunteers, employees, it's all the same. <laughs> okay. okay, that's really nice. I'm, I'm glad we can have a bit of fun together, actually. That's really cool. So, all right. So, these attachments, right, the attachments to all of these things uh, are liable to grow older. Someone who is tired, infatuated, and attached to such things. Uh, themselves liable to grow old, uh, seeks what is also liable to grow old. Yeah, so if you are uh, fond, just, just being fond and attached to these things, it means that you are seeking it, because your mind is moving in that direction, moving towards that, those things, uh, right? Uh, so uh, that is the idea of growing old. Uh, let me stop there for a, for a short while. I'm not going to say too much about this, because I talk about old age. Uh, uh, on many other retreats before, but just to maybe very briefly mention the idea of old age. And uh, it is useful to contemplate, no, knowing how to contemplate these things. Uh, and one of the ways of contemplating this is to see old age happening in the people around you. Even more powerful is to see it happening in yourself, right? Uh, and uh, I always find it interesting looking at myself in the mirror and seeing kind of uh, you know, seeing kind of new lines appearing in your face, uh, seeing kind of the hair getting more and more gray, uh, seeing your kind of gradually your muscles kind of waste away, because what happens when you get old, less muscles, uh, and everything is kind of really getting really dodgy and unpleasant. Uh. <laughs> and uh, what, does, what is interesting, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you see these things happening, yeah, even those of you who are quite young, you will see it eventually, I promise you, it's going to happen to you. You have no choice about this. Uh. <laughs> What you, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you will start to notice a reaction. Yeah? You react to it, and you are not happy about it. Is that right? Or are you happy about it when you see kind of old age creeping, creeping on? Often we're not happy about it. Yeah? It's kind of unpleasant. There is like a rejection of these things. Yeah? You're no longer in the prime of youth as you used to be. You no longer have the strength that you used to have. Your eyesight is going, I can't live without the glasses anymore. I just see a blur. I can see there are people here, but I can't barely recognize you <laughs> without my glasses. So this is life. Yeah? Things gradually, gradually going down the hill, and you see yourself gradually moving away. And the initial reaction for most people when they see that is, oh no, don't want to see it. 
Maybe you are good with this, maybe you think differently, but this is a normal reaction in the world. Uh, don't want to see that. Uh, and so you kind of sorrow and grieve and you become upset about growing older. And then the next thing you think is, what can I do to avoid this? Uh, and then you start dyeing your hair. <laughs> you start using Botox. <laughs> right? Uh, has, have, I don't know, I'm not going to ask you whether anyone has used Botox here, but <laughs> I'm, I, it always surprises me that I sometimes I hear about people who use Botox. I never thought they would use this kind of thing, but sh sure enough, they have used Botox, right? Because they, kind of, they, they don't like the wrinkling of the skin and these kind of things. Uh, and so we try to avoid the old age. We try to kind of close our eyes. We try to solve the problem. Uh, we try to use our ingenuity and plastic surgery and what have you to avoid the reality that actually is there. And then we tend to think that we can solve the problem of old age by using our money, using our resources, using whatever it is to kind of hide these things. Uh, instead of actually seeing things for what they actually are, we hide behind something. We don't want to see reality. Uh, and that is terrible. Uh, as Buddhists, it's the opposite of what we should be doing. Uh, because it stops you from being able to really see reality as it actually is. Uh, as long as you think that you have the power to overcome the effects of old age, yeah? I'm going to go to the gym more often, I'm going to kind of make sure I got enough exercise, enough Botox, enough, enough kind of makeup or whatever, and I'll, I'll be fine. It will look like I'm 20 years younger than I actually am, right? Uh, and sometimes that is exactly what people do. Huh? But actually, you're just fooling yourself. Uh, you're pretending that you can keep at bay one of the powerful natural forces in the world, which is the force of impermanence and the force of aging. You cannot uh, withstand this. So instead of doing that, uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror, right, uh, and you see that you're getting older, and maybe you don't like what you see, uh, stay there for a minute uh, and allow it to sink in. Uh, don't reject it. Don't sorrow. Just observe what is going on uh, and see what happens. Uh, and if you are able to observe the aspects of old age uh, without sorrowing, without thinking about what I can do to overcome it, uh, that is where something starts to happen. Uh, and what starts to happen is that you start to get small insights into the nature of the body. Uh, you start to think, wow, this is the reality. This is really true. Uh, why? And the moment you realize this is the truth, and you realize it's going to continue that way until you die, uh, at that moment, uh, you are reducing your attachment to the body. Uh, there's an insight that happens in you when you do it. You may not be kind of a flash of insight, uh, but there's some reality that sinks in there. Uh. And the benefit of that kind of small insight uh, is that you become more peaceful uh, because you're no longer so concerned about your body. Uh, you're no longer so concerned about whether you're old or not. Uh, you're no longer so concerned about what other people think about you. Forget about those blooming other people anyway. What, who cares what they think? They are deluded. I'm not going to care about what deluded people think uh, because their ideas are wrong anyway. Uh, don't allow yourself to be trapped by the opinions of others. Uh, yeah? If you meet someone like Ajahn Brahm, and Ajahn Brahm tells you, okay, then be worried about it. Uh, but if the person next door or the person in the street says that, wow, you're looking really old, uh, you think, yeah, now, they, you know, I, have, I have succeeded, because if the deluded people say this to me, it means I'm on the right track. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that is the right way to think about things. Yeah. Don't worry about the world. If you worry about what the world thinks about you, you are worrying about what delusion is thinking about you. And if you worry about what delusion is thinking about you, you're never going to become a wise person. So forget about that. Huh? Instead, allow the reality to sink in. Huh? You gain clarity. Huh? You become less obsessed about what you look like, concerned about it. For that reason, you become more peaceful. Huh? And when you become more peaceful, when you come to sit down in your meditation practice, uh, it's going to become more powerful because you have less attachment to the body. Yeah. The biggest problem in meditation, the number one enemy of meditation practice, uh, is attachment to the body and the five senses. Uh, if you can let go of that a little bit, even by contemplating old age in this way, uh, you're already going to have much more success as a consequence. Uh. So when we talk about uh, Insight in Buddhism uh, is important not to set the bar too high, but to be realistic about what we mean by insight. Uh, these small kind of insights, small adjustments to seeing the world as it actually is, uh, are probably far more important for you than thinking about the big insights. Uh, because the big insights are usually 
not immediately accessible to, to, to most of us, right? They're going to be far away. Huh? But these small things are always going to be useful. Even if you are a good meditator already, even if you have some success in your samadhi practice, uh, this is going to improve that success in your samadhi if you can let go of your body a little bit more. Huh? So this is the idea of uh, uh, using the idea of old age yeah, to actually gradually not allow the mind to grip your body so hard uh, and also grip the body of the people and animals and the servants <laughs> around us. So. so there you are, old age. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Uh. I was going to have a sip of this beautiful tea, first of all. So let's uh, move on to the uh, next one. And what should be described as liable to fall sick? Partners and children, male and female servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle are liable to fall sick. Yeah, everyone is liable to fall sick. This is the uh, nature of reality. It's not something you can avoid. Nothing has gone wrong. Even if you get cancer, nothing has gone wrong. It is to be expected that you get cancer. So when you get cancer, don't be surprised. Uh, say, oh yeah, I got cancer. To be expected. Is that how you think? <laughs> it's hard, right? Uh, but this is kind of the point. It's a little bit difficult, but that's kind of the idea. These attachments are liable to fall sick. Someone who is tied, infatuated, and attached to such things, uh, themselves liable to falling sick, seek what is also liable to fall sick. So, um, this is the, in many ways similar to the previous one. Old age and sickness are obviously linked in many ways, not completely linked, but they have quite a lot in common. Uh, and uh, again, it is useful to uh, Reflect on this in the right way, in the way which can be, you know, can be useful for you to let go of the body a little bit. Uh, and uh, here, the reflection that you can use here is actually quite similar to the reflection for old age. And this is the idea that when you see people around you getting sick, uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, do you feel? Does it feel bad? Uh, let's say that one of your family members fall sick. Yeah, maybe your parents or your children or your husband and wife or whatever it is, uh, how does that feel to you? Huh? And very often the first thing that we feel, we feel, oh no, we feel just like old age. We feel bad about it when it happens. Yeah? And don't, of course, you feel bad about it. That's not, not really the, that's to be expected in many ways. Uh, but uh, uh, the next thing we think after feeling bad about it is how can I overcome this? Uh, how can we heal this sickness? Right? Uh, and then we try to use our energy, to use our will, to use our intentions to get out of the problem. And again, because we use our willpower, we use our energy to overcome the problem, it makes us feel as if we have the power and the ability to overcome the difficult difficulties of life. In the same way as we use our energy to avoid the signs of old age, it feels like we can overcome old age. In the same way, when it comes to sickness, we try our very best to overcome it. And then when we succeed, we think, yeah, it's because I tried really hard. Yeah, I, I kind of went on the right kind of cure and I ate the right food and exercised in the right way so I could defeat illness. Yay, you know, we, we have the power. Illness is not powerful. We are more powerful than sickness. And sometimes you find religions who kind of think in this way. Huh? I think a large part of what we call the New Age movement is about this sort of thing, overcoming the sicknesses of the body and these kind of things. Uh, but it is delusion. Uh, it is delusory. Maybe sometimes you can overcome sickness, uh, but sometimes you can't. Yeah? People die all the time uh, of sicknesses, uh, and we just remember the ones that survive. We forget about the ones that die, and then we delude us into thinking that it's possible 
by using our willpower, using our effort to overcome these things. Uh, so that gives us an illusion that we are in control when actually we are not. Uh, so what we should do instead when someone falls sick, when you yourself fall sick, uh, we should do exactly the same thing as we did with old age. Uh, we should ask ourselves, we should stop for a moment uh, and ask ourselves what is going on. Uh, and we should remind ourselves this is the nature of being a human being. Uh, you can expect to fall sick. You can expect to have a heart attack, to have cancer, to have Alzheimer's, to have all of these kind of things. These things are part and parcel of what it means to be a human being. And that is the reality, so you stop for a while. Even small things like COVID. COVID is nothing, right? Tiny little thing, tiny blip on the radar screen. I, <laughs> I just... Uh, Thinking, I was thinking about myself because I last time I was here is almost exactly three years ago. That was February 2020, and uh, when I came here, I became sick. Remember that, Bobby? Yeah, and he had to take me off to the doctor. And what was really strange was that I had just come through Changi Airport on my way here, and that was when there was a COVID cluster or whatever at Changi Airport at that time. And I came here. I had this kind of slightly like a flu, but it wasn't exactly like a flu. I had a bit of fever, I was feeling a bit out of sorts. Uh, and so they took me to the doctor, uh, and the doctor said, yeah, yeah, I was kind of a really relaxed doctor. Yeah, I don't know what the local doctors are, this one was really relaxed. Some kind of, in, it was kind of Indian background, he said, yeah, yeah, whatever, don't worry too much. And he gave me some kind of, you know, anti-cold, anti-flu medicine. Uh, and so I said to him, well, maybe this is COVID. It feels a bit strange. I've just come through Changi Airport. It could be COVID. He said, yeah, if it's COVID, don't worry about it. We can't test anyway, so just go back and kind of be happy with it. <laughs> 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 okay. So, I, so I, it may very well be that I've had COVID. I don't know. It's, it's possible I had COVID at the very, very beginning. I'm unsure. I've never had COVID since, but at, what, at one time seems to have been a possibility. And so... Um, <laughs> anyway, so, but every time you have these kind of illnesses, yeah, you take a moment to reflect on, well, actually, this is the nature of the body. And that ill, to become ill is very unpleasant, yeah, you feel out of it, you can't do anything, you lose all your energy, and you can't really do what you want in the world, and I, if I, I get ill very, very rarely, I tend to have very good health, uh, except when I get COVID here in KL, but, <laughs> <coughs> and, <laughs> And, but when I get it, I feel it's just so miserable. Huh? And it reminds you that actually this too huh, is the nature of the human body. Yeah? If you are lucky in one lifetime not to get ill very often, well, okay, great. You have some good karma from the past or whatever. But generally speaking, we should expect illnesses in this life. Huh? And again, if you think about it in that way, if you use that opportunity to gain that insight, stop Reflect. The Buddha was teaching about this. You are growing in wisdom right there. Instead of pushing it away because it is unpleasant, because you don't want to deal with it, allow it to sink in. This is the nature of the human body. What happens? It happens exactly the same thing as when you are dealing with old age, right? What happens is that you uh, let go of the body a little bit. You uh, come and do your meditation here in the morning. Please come in the morning if you feel like it. Don't have to, you can. At 8.30 we start the meditation for those of you who didn't make it this morning. Uh, uh, come, try it out, and you will actually find that the meditation goes deeper because you have let go of the body a little bit through a very simple contemplation. Uh, it reminds me of this beautiful teaching that Ajahn Shah had, yeah? Ajahn Shah, Lumpur Shah, Ajahn Brahm's teacher. Uh, and apparently he said things like, everything teaches you. Uh, and very often we don't take the opportunity of learning from the things around us. Uh, yeah? Things that we all have to deal with, illness, old age, uh, looking at the world outside, falling apart. Uh, it's almost every opportunity, every moment in life, uh, there are things that can teach us about the nature of reality. Take those opportunities. Uh, and if you take those opportunities, you are going to grow in wisdom incredibly fast. Uh, and this is where the right view, the very first factor of the noble eightfold path, becomes stronger. Uh, the, I can't, it's hard to overestimate the uh, idea of right view. It's incredibly important. Uh, and what we are doing by the kind of contemplations I'm talking about now, this is about right view. Uh, I don't know if you ever even considered that, right? Maybe you think, oh, right view means believing in karma and rebirth. Okay, I've got right view, finished with number one factor, let's go to number two. No, 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 no. It's, 
It's not like that, uh, yeah? Right view is profound. Right view is something you have to develop your entire life. And as you do that, it becomes this force at the root of the path that helps you to develop the path more powerfully. This happens in two ways, yeah? First of all, when you uh, strengthen the idea of right view, it just makes the path work better as a consequence. Uh, but when you strengthen the power of right view, it also makes the path more urgent. Uh, you feel a sense of urgency in your practice. Uh, why? Because you understand the nature of these things, uh, and you understand how, sig how important it is precisely to use every moment of your life uh, uh, to develop this path, because time is shorter. Uh, Life is short. Before you know it, it's all over. And then it is, maybe it is too late. You don't know where you're going to be reborn in your next life. Maybe you get reborn in a country where you can't even be a Buddhist. Yeah, imagine that. Some countries, if you are a Buddhist, they chop your head off. Yeah, that's kind of bad news, isn't it? So don't, please don't get reborn in those countries, because then you have, you have a serious problem. So... Uh, let me stop there, uh, because uh, it is, uh, time is, again, uh, going fast. Let's do a little bit more meditation together, have a quick Q&A afterwards. Sir.
<coughs> okay. All right, everyone. So, uh, anyone like to ask any questions or comment on anything? We have someone at the back there, Bobby. Yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn. I'd like to know a little bit uh, more about rebirth. Mm -hmm. um, is rebirth a process? And actually, what goes through the rebirth? Is it a soul, <laughs> um, our mind? <laughs> and uh, what's the difference between reincarnation and rebirth? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So is it a process? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, it is a process. Everything in life is pretty much a process. So you can expect rebirth to follow along with everything else. And uh, uh, the way that uh, it is talked about in the sutta sometimes is that they talk about an intermediate existence. Uh, this is one of those controversial topics in Buddhism uh, because uh, uh, some people say there is intermediate, intermediate existence, some people say there's not, but I think it's quite clear in the sutta that there is such a thing. So you die, yeah, and then when you die you kind of go into an intermediate state uh, and you can imagine if you have looked at some of the uh, uh, some of these videos on near-death experiences, people have this feeling of going into, you know, you're leaving your body, the body is left behind, uh, but you haven't really crossed over into a certain new life yet. Yeah, There's this feeling that if I go beyond a certain boundary, I cannot return. And that then probably is what we call rebirth, when you go beyond that boundary. Huh? But uh, in the meantime, you stay in a kind of intermediate existence, uh, and sometimes you still have the ability to come back to your existing body if you stay in that intermediate existence. Uh, and it is then that you kind of, you, you know, sometimes you hear about the near-death experience, people have like a life review, yeah? Now, if you read the suttas, the word of the Buddha, the Buddha says, you know, you go to a certain realm or certain place, and then you kind of, your life is reviewed, yeah? In the suttas, it has the idea of the uh, yama, yama, the lord of death, uh, and uh, yama is reminding you of your bad, of your, not your bad, your bad and good qualities, yeah? And then you judge yourself according to your life review. Huh? And the way that the life review is supposed to happen is like you are a third person watching your own life. You see your own life progressing uh, as a witness to your own life, uh, and then at the end of that, because you are seeing yourself just like a third person, it's like you judge yourself. And if you judge yourself badly, it means you send yourself to a bad realm. Yeah? If you judge yourself well because you've been living well, you send yourself to a good destination. And so sometimes it is useful in this life to kind of take that third person perspective on ourselves. Look back, stand apart from ourselves yeah? a little bit, if you can, and try to... Uh, see if you're living your life in a good way or not, and maybe uh, adjust a little bit if it isn't quite right. Uh, and then, depending then on how you judge yourself, then of course you will take rebirth accordingly. So the uh, the rebirth process, then you can see here what is going on is that your mind is always there, yeah, because it's always you are there. You have left your body behind, but your mind is always going with you. It's a continuation of what you were before. You remember your past life. That was my past life, that's how, you, how it looks to you, and now I'm moving into a future existence. It is your mind moving into that future existence. So, so what is that mind? And uh, what that mind is not, it is not like a permanent entity, like a soul or some kind of inherent part of uh, you, yeah, that is the real you, it's nothing like that. Uh, the mind that you have when you get reborn is the same as the mind you have in this life. Uh, and if you look at your mind in this life, well, what is it? Well, it is this continuity, yeah? It is this kind of feeling inside of you, the me kind of feeling, yeah? The feeling of experiencing things, of having feelings, of uh, perceiving the world, of willing, of doing things. Uh, all that mental activity is what your mind is. Uh, so what is it? Well, it is this impermanent flow, this thing that is always changing, always going from one thing to the next one. Uh, if you look for an entity, if you look for something stable in that flow of the mind, uh, there's nothing there that is stable, nothing that is the uh, kind of the, um, the real you, if you like. Uh, all there is is changing phenomena all the time, changing, changing. And that sequence, that series of changing phenomena continues when you die and also moves into a future life. Uh, so it is the stream of consciousness, uh, the stream of the mind, uh, 
that goes from one life to the next one, settled in this life and also settled in future lives. Uh, and that is kind of the idea uh, how the rebirth process works. Uh, so rebirth does not require a soul. It doesn't require something inherently existing to pass from one life to the next one. Uh, what is the difference between reincarnation and rebirth? Well, these are just words, uh, so it depends how you use them. Yeah, it's up to you. You can use them whatever way you like. Yeah. But usually, uh, or often, the idea is that reincarnation uh, has the idea of a soul moving on, right? So that's why we don't use it in Buddhism, because it's often used in that particular way. Whereas rebirth just means that there is a, you know, the, my, the flow of the mind goes on from one life to the next one. Yeah. That is maybe the distinction there. Yeah. Are you happy with that reply? What do you, yeah, okay, good. So, yeah, excellent. Uh, so, uh, please, uh, yeah, fire yeah, away. I can. Uh, the five daily contemplation, also something really uh, quite similar to this uh, sutta. So, can we combine when we do the uh, five daily contemplation? Yeah, absolutely. So, they, that is true. The five uh, daily contemplation, these are the five themes and they found in the Gutra number five is a, and these contemplations are the contemplation on uh, sickness, old age, death, uh, on uh, everything is, that's dear and pleasing to me must be separated, must become otherwise and I'm the owner of Makamba is the last one, these are the five uh, and this is very closely related to that. Uh, so absolutely if you do those five you're basically doing, doing this kind of contemplation, so absolutely. And uh, one of the nice things the Buddha says about those five contemplations is that they should be done by everyone, yeah? Whether you are a woman or a man, whether you are a nun or a monk, yeah? this is for the whole world to do these kind of uh, contemplations. So, so thank you for that, yeah. yeah. Hi, afternoon, Ajahn. Hello. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, related to this. Assuming that I cannot achieve my enlightenment this life, yeah, how should I do so that I can be born nearer to Buddhist, being a Buddhist, or being nearer to the presence of where I can go towards Nirvana? Okay, so what you should do is you should just practice to the best of your ability in this life, do as much as you possibly can, yeah, and uh, the more you do in this life, uh, you will, that's where you will start out in your next life. Uh, so there's two things you should do. First of all, you should try to understand the Buddha's teachings properly. And if you understand the teaching properly, it means that in your next life you will recognize the teaching, and so you will probably become a Buddhist again because you recognize the teachings, right? Uh, so you learn the teachings, you carry on in your next life. Uh, the second thing you should do is you should uh, uh, practice as well as you can so your heart is as pure as possible so you have a good starting point in your next life. Yeah? You get rid of most of the anger and ill will. You develop more compassion and understanding and kindness for all the people in the world. And those qualities will be with you when you kind of get reborn, wherever you get reborn in your next life. The third thing you should do is make sure you have a lot of Kalyanamitas. Yeah? Uh, number one Kalyanamitta is the Buddha. So make sure you make the Buddha your friend. Yeah? This is what we're learning on this retreat, how to make the Buddha your friend. because we're going straight back to the suttas. Uh, make sure that you have many Kalanimittas, many good teachers uh, who teach you uh, the teachings in a way that aligns with the Buddha's word. Uh, yeah? So good teachers in this life. Uh, make sure you have many Kalanimittas in your ordinary life, like all the people around you here now. And when you have lots of friends who think in the right way, very likely you will be reborn among those friends again in the future, because we are the people we are attached to, that is also where we get reborn. Uh, so those are the three things, yeah? Understand the teachings properly, uh, practice to the best of your ability, and ensure that you have good Kalyanamitas. Uh, yeah? Understand teachings, practice well Kalyanamitas, uh, then you're going to be in business. Uh. It's important to be in business. Please. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ajahn, <laughs> yeah. yeah, still on the subject of rebirth. Yes. Uh, I think you mentioned that rebirth is central to the Buddhist teaching. Yeah. Uh, but understanding the process of rebirth is problematic to me. In the sense that, in, I think in none of the sutta, the, the rebirth process has been mentioned in any of the uh, sutta, if I understand it correctly. It's not mentioned. It's not mentioned. The, the process of rebirth, the mechanics of rebirth, I think it's not mentioned anywhere in the sutta. And uh, in fact, I think one of the monks was commenting that 
he think he understand the ripple process. He said it is a consciousness that passed from one life to another life. Yeah. And Buddha actually scolded him on that. He said, did I actually tell you that? Well, it's true because it yeah. depends. It, it, it depends how. Sorry, are you finished now? Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, yeah. yeah. If you understand correctly, when one pass, when we pass away, yeah. when we die, all the five aggregate stop, consciousness stop. So I think the process of uh, rebirth, yeah. I think, it's, it's quite difficult to understand. I think from how yeah. how the process actually happened, and also when Buddha was when Buddha was asked. What happened to him when he passed away? Yeah. And when Arham passed away, did he exist or did not exist? I think he refused to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's very problematic for me yeah. to understand uh, how rebirth should take place. Yeah, okay. And so, you, you, know, uh, you quote the example of a near death experience uh, and uh, uh, the. Re Recording the past life, yeah. uh, using reverb as an explanation, I think is plausible, but that may not be the only explanation. Okay, so yeah, so, so yeah. I'm, I'm still having trouble understanding the process. All right, sure. Okay, well, that's a lot of questions. Like, let's see if I can can unravel this a little bit. So, uh, the, um, the the first thing you're saying is that it's not really explained the process in the suttas uh, properly. Yeah? And uh, the reason, f it is explained, a little, if you start looking in the suttas, in, it's not explained maybe in one place, but if you start looking in many different places, you can actually put together a picture that gives us some idea what is happening here. And I think that is what sometimes what you have to do. Here. And uh, the picture, and I think there is a reason for that, because the point of the Buddha is not to explain all the mechanics and details of things. Uh, the point of the Buddha is to give you a big picture of reality here. And if you start to explain all the little mechanics, all the little details, uh, then very often the details will vary depending on circumstances, right? Uh, so that's why it is very hard to explain the details without making it specific. You can maybe explain the details for one person, but for another person may be different. Uh, and for that reason, it's better to explain an overall idea that works for everyone rather than going into the details. Uh, so often it's better to give a broad stroke a broad picture view rather than go into the details. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why the Buddha doesn't do that. Uh, so for example, just to give you an idea, for example, if you, uh, if you die in a, uh, you know, because you have very powerful kamma, yeah, this is I think according to the commentary, but also implied in the suttas, if your kamma is very, very strong, so that you have the ability to enter a state of samadhi, for example, uh, then the process that happens is that as you are going through the dying process, because you are used to the samadhi, the mind will go naturally to samadhi and will go into a jhana state. Because the mind goes into the jhana state, you get reborn into jhana like that. And there is no intermediate state for that kind of person. You just go straight from one life to the next one. Or say that you have a very powerful bad kama, very you've done something very terrible, killing your parents, or I don't know what what it is. Then the Again, the kamma is so strong that it may take you straight away to a very bad state because the kamma is so so powerful. But then again, there are people whose kamma is somewhere in between, right? So you have people like like most people done a little bit bad, a lot of good, a lot of neither good nor bad. And then when they die, they kind of uh, they are you know their mind is kind of somewhere in between. Uh, and that's why you go to maybe to this intermediate state uh, where you are and you kind of hang out for a while. Uh, and it's very. <laughs> <laughs> and in the suttas, and actually, the, it, it's very good evidence that there is such an intermediate state, even though, according to the tra tra traditional Theravada, there is no intermediate state. In the suttas, the evidence is quite strong, and many people have written about this. Uh, and that is where you kind of go, and then you, you know, you, um, you, are, you are there, and that's maybe where you have your life review, and various things happen. And then when you are ready, the karma ripens. Well, then actually, you go on to the next state as a consequence. So there are many alternatives. Uh, and then to talk about the mechanics, yeah, it can very easily, you can easily get trapped into the details uh, without actually looking at the overview of what is happening. But the Buddha does talk a little bit about the mechanics as well. So what he says, and this is what you find, for example, in the Nidana Sangyutta. This, this is the Sangyutta Nikaya on all the connected discourses of the Buddha. Nidana Sangyutta is all about dependent origination. And dependent origination is really about the rebirth process, uh, yeah? That is what actually it concerns. Uh, and so one of the things that it says in that sutta, it says that uh, uh, 
it talks about the inclination of the mind. Yeah? So the inclination of the mind that you have when you die, that is what then causes the mind to move in that direction on, upon rebirth. Uh, yeah? So if your mind, if you have developed your mind in samadhi in this life, uh, and you have easy access to samadhi, because you have easy access, your mind inclines towards it. It, you, it inclines toward it because it's enjoyable, and you have access to it. Uh, and then your mind goes there, and then it gets reborn accordingly because of that inclination of the mind. So if you can know the inclination of your mind right now, and for example, you will know that you try to do some meditation and you will see what is going on in your mind, that thing that goes on in your mind, that is your inclination usually, especially after you relax a little bit. You let go of the superficial things, the deeper things are the inclination of the mind. And very often that will be sensual things. It will be thinking about your life now, maybe your, your job, your family, or, or whatever it may be, some of the, what are you going to eat, or whatever it is, yeah? And that is a sensual inclination of the mind. Or it may be that you are enjoying your meditation, so maybe your mind is going towards peace, uh, depending on your personality. Uh, that gives you an idea of where your mind is inclining, and this is in line with how this is explained in that sutta. The inclination of the mind uh, is where it actually goes in the future. Uh. So the process is really just that uh, as long as there is craving, craving has this ability to project you into the future, uh, so it just carries on, right? Just because the body dies, uh, there is no need for any process. Uh, the point is just that the mind cannot stop as long that, as long as there is craving. Uh, and that idea that the mind cannot stop as long as there is craving, that is the insight of a stream enter. Uh, so that may be hard for you to understand that, or hard for most people to understand, because this is part of what the insight is about. Uh, remember, we're talking here about the cause of, of suffering, the second noble truth. Tanha is the cause of suffering. Why? Because it is the cause of rebirth. Pornobhavika tanha, rebirth causing uh, suffering. And what you, so what you see as part of being a stream mentor, you see how craving projects the mind into the future. As long as there is craving, the mind cannot stop. And just because the body goes, the body is irrelevant. The body is nothing. Yeah, the body is just, uh, just an empty shell. <laughs> and so that is what you understand. Through that. So there's not much to really, it, there isn't much mechanics to it. Uh, it's just the fact that the mind cannot stop uh, as long as there is craving. Yeah. I think one of the problems is that we take the body as too important. Uh, we think that the body is somehow uh, even more fundamental than the mind. The mind is somehow attached to the body. So when the body dies, yeah, then the mind will go. So how can, it, how can it be that the mind can exist apart from the body? But actually it's the other way around. Uh, the mind is primary, the body is secondary. The body is like an appendage to the mind. Uh, yeah? So whether the body is here or not actually is quite irrelevant. Uh, and that's why when you hear about the near-death experiences, uh, it is like you come out of your body, but you have an alternative body. Uh, a body which looks just like this one, a body that can see, hear, has all the indrias, all the faculties of this body, uh, but it is not the physical body. It is a, it's a more fine material kind of body instead, uh, right? Uh, it is drawn out of the other body. Uh, so the physical body that we have here, we make too much out of it. Uh, we come from the modern materialist perspective of the world, uh, where material phenomena are primary, the mind is secondary. Uh, but actually what we need to do, we need to reverse that equation, and we need to say that the mind is primary, and the material phenomena of the world is secondary. Uh, and if we reflect on it, I think it's quite obvious that that has to be the case, uh, yeah? Because our primary thing in the world is our experience. Uh, we experience the world, and then we deduce from that experience, we deduce the material world, we deduce the laws of physics, we deduce the cosmos around us. But the primary thing is experience, and the primary thing of experience is consciousness, it is mind, it is inner feelings, it is the inner world that, that is primary. And this is why I think when you, again, from the suttas, when the Buddha talks about what is primary, he, he talked about this in the Rohitassa Sutta, for example. Uh, yeah, Rohitassa, he, who is this kind of first astronaut who tries to walk to the end of the universe. Uh, and the Buddha says, no, the universe or the world is found inside this fathom long body with its consciousness. Yeah? It is your experience. That is the world. Uh, that is the beginning of the world, the origin of the world. That is the end of the world. Uh, forget about the world outside. Uh, we don't know anything about the world outside. It's a cipher. It is uncertain. Don't know what it is. Uh, 
all we can really know is the world inside our own experience. Uh, that is always primary. Uh, so once we start to think about things in a different way, and we start to think about the mind as primary, it resolves so many of those hard questions that we think are there, which actually may not be very hard at all. Uh, so it is just uh, craving is the power that drives this process forward. Uh, craving is the thing that projects us into the future. Uh, and as long as that is there, the process must carry on. Uh, there isn't really much, much to that process. It is just kind of a carrying on of phenomena uh, as they are. And then you move on and you get reborn. And maybe you take up another body, yeah? another appendage to the mind, uh, wherever that might be as a consequence. Uh, Maybe it's getting late, uh, so we, Lynn, can, we, can, we, can you write down a question here? And we can maybe do it later on today, because uh, otherwise we don't have a chance to have a break. Yeah? And a break is important. Uh, so uh, <laughs> so let, uh, let, let me just see what is happening here. So we sp oh, it's only a very short break anyway, 2.30, 2.45, jeepers. Uh, we only have five minutes, <laughs> five minutes left. Okay, let's have a, a ten minute break, uh, everyone, and then we can come back afterwards and carry on the discussion if you like. Yeah. <laughs>